Hi, I'm Rani Haibi, CTO of Networking, Edge, and Access at the Linux Foundation. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how open source software projects help make modern 5G networks more secure. First, let's talk about what's driving open source software for 5G networks. With increased competition, operators seek operational agility to allow them to address market needs and cost reduction to allow them to stay competitive in the market. With increased networks com network complexity, there's a need for software controlled automation. And they need to build and secure scalable networks across multiple edge locations. If we look at a traditional way for telco innovation, we know that there is, has been a strong reliance on standardization, which means that traditionally, first standards were developed by a multi-company work group that were designed at the specification to address new use cases. Then there was vendor specific limitation, meaning each R&D team of each vendor interpreted the specification and created an implementation based on their understanding. Then there was a need for what is called interoperability testing, where companies get together and try to make their products talk to each other, often finding out that there could be more than one interpretation of the specification, which called for the next phase of where R&D teams go back to the drawing board, refine their implementation based on their understanding, and then prepare for the next phase of testing and at some point go back to the testing phase, repeat that until the desired result is achieved. Now with open source software, there's a way to accelerate the process. What we're seeing is that open source implementations happen in parallel to the standard specification. This is a joint effort and it continues to evolve as the spec evolves. But at the same time, it creates this uh, feedback loop that you see in the middle of this diagram, this feedback loop between the standardization process and the open source development allows the open source community to identify ambiguity and errors in the specification to propose practical solutions for these issues. And after that, updating the specifications, the the open source implementation can also be updated and continue this uh, continuous feedback loop. Uh, this way, based on the learning of the implementation experience, uh, the standard specification process can incorporate the changes before it's finalized, therefore uh, completing the process faster and providing a better outcome. We're seeing that approach of using open source software proliferate across network domains. This is just a partial list of projects that are used in, in networks, open source projects that are used in networks. You can see it starts with the core network and the cloud domain where there are uh, various different projects at various uh, layers of the stack. It continues to the edge network, either the service provider edge or the extreme user edge, where there are various open source projects addressing the needs uh, and the infrastructure there. And it goes all the way even to the enterprise network where we see open source usage for enterprise use cases. Now that, now that we understand why open source makes sense for networks, let's talk about the security threats that exist. So as we know, all software is under attack via vulnerabilities or supply chain weaknesses. Uh, here you can see a very small list of recent, uh, very famous incidents and vulnerabilities that were discovered and got high visibility, uh, starting with attacks on uh, popular infrastructure like GitHub, uh, vulnerabilities in popular libraries like Log4j, uh, attacks on the supply chain that compromised popular software like SolarWinds that created uh, threats to uh, crucial infrastructure. And recent studies have shown that their amount of attacks continues to be on the rise. A research and survey conducted by the Linux Foundation 
discovered that out of the surveyed organizations, 98% uh, said that they are using open source software and 95% of the organizations stated that they are concerned about the security of open source software. However, less than half of the surveyed companies said that they're using software build of materials, SBOMs, or a methodical way to trace and track the origins of the open source software that they're using. Another research conducted by the Linux Foundation uh, was based on more than 600,000 data points coming from software composition analysis tools and security companies. And some of the findings in this survey were very interesting, and they indicated that the entire software development lifecycle is important, not just the vulnerability management. Also, it identified that packaging and integration are an important part of securing the entire software supply chain. And it identified that several projects within domains, a few projects within domains actually determine the criticality of security because they are very widely used by other projects. When looking at 5G networks, we see a large set of security risks. It starts with the increased attack surface. When we're talking in 5G about millions and even billions of devices connected to the network, 5G makes it even more dangerous uh, than before. There is a risk for more sophisticated botnets and there is a higher risk for privacy and, and data extraction. Uh, more IoT devices mean more problems. Uh, again, the 5G networks enables more uh, IoT devices to connect to the network, but we all know that these devices are inherently insecure and most times security is not, is not built in by design. So each insecure IoT devices in the organization network represents another potential security hole that can be exploited by an attacker. Another issue is the decreased network visibility. With 5G, networks expand and become more usable by mobile users and devices, which means that there's more traffic network traffic to manage and analyze, but companies may not be able to gain the network visibility that they had before that, requ uh, that is required to identify anomalies or identify attacks on time. And then there are issues related to uh, supply chain and the software. So compared to traditional mobile networks, 5G is more reliant on software, which elevates the risk of exploitations uh, of the network infrastructure. Currently, there is also a limited set of vendors in the supply chain, which means that it's even more susceptible to attacks. And that increased the potential for uh, insecure components being uh, injected as part of this supply chain. Now, open source 5G is at the intersection of these threats coming from the software world and the 5G world. Uh, just to highlight a few of the threats, we have uh, software and configuration related threats, meaning more software means more uh, configuration that needs to be maintained and attackers can modify those configuration, reduce the security and gain access to the network and install malware and create, another, uh, create other risks. Uh, the other issue is network security where if network devices are compromised through a network layer expert, malicious actors can obtain uh, unauthorized access to the entire 5G network. <clears throat> Another new feature in open source 5G or 5G networks is the network slicing. And that uh, creates the risk of improper network slice management that may allow malicious actors to access data from different slices or deny access to users of other slices. So that's a whole new uh, aspect of, of security that needs to be dealt with. Then it's important to remember there are uh, legacy communication infrastructure threats. So 5G <clears throat> supports all the security and the specification uh, of the protocols of the 4G legacy communication. So in addition to the new threats, all the old threats are still in existence. 
another aspect is the multi-access edge computing or MEC, the introduction of untrusted 5G components into the multi-edge, uh, into the edge could expose core network elements to risks and that are introduced by software and hardware vulnerabilities of, this, of these edge components. Uh, another risk is uh, presented by spectrum sharing where 5G systems require a complement of spectrum sp uh, frequencies to uh, reach their maximum potential. This may provide more opportunities for malicious actors to jam or interfere with different uh, bandwidths. Uh, then finally, there's the architecture of software defined networks where um, the architecture automatically configures routes and other network aspects centrally using an SDN controller. While SDN improves the network flexibility and ease of management, it also allows malicious actors to embed code in the SDN controller and applications to uh, conflict bandwidth and negatively affect the operations of the network. So let's talk about what the Linux Foundation networking projects are doing to improve the security and what are the best practices. First of all, it's important to understand that there is no silver bullet. Uh, making the software code available as open source is a good starting point, but it's not the whole story. Um, there actually needs to be a holistic process that takes care of making the software more secure. The Linux Foundation networking views open source security as a continuously proven process that evolves as the project itself evolves in its maturity level and the phase of adoption by end users. So throughout the software project lifecycle, additional investment are required to make security, uh, to make the software more secure. And that involves process definitions, security audits and security threat modeling. Elephant projects aim to develop security best practices in several areas. Some of them are uh, in the early stages of the requirement and the architecture definition, then that's when security is taken into consideration. Uh, it goes through the development framework that the developers use and the tools such as code scanners and SBOM software bills of materials. And it continues with vulnerability testing of the software and guidelines for secure configuration of the deployed software. This is all a group effort. It can't be done by just one or two individuals. It requires the knowledge and expertise of entire communities. This is why under the Linux Foundation networking, we have several work groups, task forces, and security committees that are dealing with improving the security of our software and, and the derived products. And that involves everything from the design phases, the development through the deployments and all the way until the software is uh, decommissioned. We also uh, try to track our security posture at all times. And for that, we use dashboard for continuous tracking of issues and trends related to security. When looking at the security supply chains, there are multiple actions that need to be uh, that need to happen for that security chain uh, supply chain to be secure. So it starts on the left side, as you see, with securing the integrity of the source code, and that involves different actions such as identifying and securing uh, the the tools and the most critical components of the software and educating the developers on how to build better or more secure source code. Then it continues on the right side of this diagram with the building integrity or what is called the securing the software factory or how the software is produced. And that involves using uh, tracking tools such as software bills of materials and also identifying uh, critical parts of the stack and identifying uh, attack vectors. It turns out that most projects and organizations are not able to accurately summarize the software that is running under your system and especially its dependencies. So there is this diagram on the left that is coming from an actual comic script, uh, strip, but 
it actually depicts the real harsh reality of where many modern dig digital infrastructure and software actually relies deep down on some obscure software libraries that is uh, that are maintained by some unknown individual who nobody ever met and that is uh, creates a, a, a serious uh, security threat um, to, to the entire software stack. So I mentioned SBOM, but I would like to uh, say a few more words about what is it exactly. So the National Telecommunication and Information Administration in the US defines it as uh, a formal machine-readable inventory of software components and dependencies and information about those components and their hierarchical relationship, as you can see in the sample diagram below. SBOMs may include open source or proprietary software, um, so it's not something that is specific to open source software. And they can be either widely available to the public or be access restricted and viewable only by a few. SBOMs should include baseline attributes with the ability to uniquely identify individual components because uh, identifying components can be a bit challenging because there might be some ambiguity of the library name uh, that makes it sometimes difficult to identify which is which and who is who in the components. Most efficiently, the most efficient way to generate SBOMs is a byproduct of the modern development process, meaning integrating it with the CI CD process. But there are other methods, maybe suitable for older software, where this SBOM can be generated uh, manually. Uh, speaking about the Linux Foundation networking projects, we've implemented SBOM for several projects, starting with one of the most mature and widely developed projects in the under the LFN ONAP. So the community implemented SBOM generation. It uses a template uh, of the SPDX uh, format, and it is implemented using LF networking CI pipeline and can be easily leveraged by other open source project groups. Uh, Anuket, another LFN project, identified SBOM as one of the security measures for creating a robust telco infrastructure. Uh, this is already included as part of the project holistic security requirement specifications and, um, and in other places in this project. Finally, Open Daylight, uh, where the community working on this project has recently successfully added automatic generation of SBOM using the Cyclone DX format. This is expected to become available in the coming releases of this project. Another aspect of security I mentioned is the dashboards that help us uh, stay on top of things and understand where we stand with, re with regards to security. Uh, so the LF networking projects make use of the Linux Foundation LFX infrastructure that provides security dashboards for projects and allows projects to easily get onboarded to these dashboards and immediately get uh, throws of information related to the security of the software. As you can see here, those LFX dashboards uh, include several views, starting with summary cards, which highlight the trends and uh, issue uh, counts. And you, uh, it goes down to more detailed information that is project specific about the number of issues, the number of issues resolved over time, uh, and how many open issues exist and so on and so forth. So we found uh, those tools to be uh, highly reliable and highly useful uh, to determine our um, position with regards to security. And this is something that is being constantly monitored uh, by the entire community. Here are some of the other lessons we've learned through the development of the secure software and the Linux Foundation networking. First is that all developers should be trained on how to develop and acquire secure software. Uh, there is a training course available by the OpenSSF project of the Linux Foundation about secure software development. Um, this makes software development uh, 
develop their software to be secure by default. It's a highly recommended course uh, available to everyone free of charge uh, and has been already uh, been used by uh, many of our projects. The other uh, tools that we're using is the OpenSSF Best Practices badge. Again, another uh, tool offered by the OpenSSF project where projects can self-evaluate and make sure they're following the best practices for developing secure software. There are many tools to find vulnerability and most of them can be integrated into the CI CD pipeline of projects. So there are quality scanners and linters. There are security code scanners that do static or dynamic analysis. There are uh, secret scanning to find out the use of secret in the codes, embedded in the code. Uh, there are software composition analysis tools and many other tools, including fuzzers and others. Uh, there is a convenient guide, again, provided by the OpenSSF project uh, from the uh, security tooling workgroup, uh, which lists many of those uh, available tools, and we recommend using as many of them for your projects. Uh, then we realized there is a need for monitoring for known vulnerabilities in what you depend on. And each project should have a process defined for that on how to keep track on dependencies and how to respond when vulnerabilities and dependencies are discovered. Uh, there is a need to enable rapid uh, dependency updates, which means it's best to use package managers and automated tests. So package managers can, in, can be uh, things like language level, Python package managers, or container like Docker uh, image, um, image uh, managers. And there should be tests in place to make sure that all packages include the latest updates and patches. Uh, another things that, uh, thing that to, to pay attention to is evaluating the software before selecting dependencies. Uh, there could be all kinds of different ways to uh, inject malicious software into open source libraries. So we have to be very careful about that. Tycho squatting uh, is a method of um, malicious actors to create uh, vulnerable or uh, insecure software packages and make them masquerade as legitimate software packages. So there's uh, a need to pay attention to that. And uh, in general, it, re it requires uh, a good review of what exactly are we integrating into our projects. Um, the next thing is making it easier for end users to update our software, uh, meaning uh, that whenever there is a security vulnerability discovered and we uh, issue a fix for that, it should be easy for our end users to use the, the patch version, which means that we need to make sure it's easy to update our project. Usually it means that we need to have stable APIs that would make it uh, less, uh, uh, less interruptive for our end users to, to change the version to the latest and patched one. And then we learned that there is a need to continuously improve. Attackers keep getting better. So the defense mechanisms should also keep track of that and keep evolving over time. A few of the lessons learned with regards to using uh, open source software. Um, first of all, some of the questions that you, we should ask ourselves is, is there evidence that the developers of the software we're using are actually working to make it secure. And the list in the previous slide is a good place to start and see how many of, of those best practices are actually used by the software that we are about to use. Then uh, you should ask yourself whether it's easy to use the software securely, meaning is all the default setting out of the box of this software component that we're using indicate that it can be used securely and that it is hardened. The next question to ask is, is this software library maintained? Um, we need to check for recent commits, issues, releases, and see if the um, project is actually keeps getting fr uh, frequent updates in security and other aspects. Um, things like whether there are multi organization working on the project, whether it's not a 
um, a single company or a single organization project. All these indicate a project that is constantly uh, evolving and constantly providing security updates. Uh, the other thing to look at is whether the project we're using has any significant use in the industry. Um, beware of projects that are not really used and um, therefore probably are not likely to receive uh, frequent security updates and not likely to have security issues um, detected and identified. Uh, another thing to look at is the software license. Uh, another red flag is when the software that we're about to use have no uh, license. That means it's not really an open source library and that can also indicate that it's not very secure, not receiving the right security updates. Um, of course, the best way is to evaluate the software you're using yourself. Remember, it's open source software, so it makes it possible for you to go in, look at the code and review the code level, uh, the project that you're using and determine whether what you're about to use is has the adequate security mechanisms that you're expecting. And last but not least, remember to make sure that you're acquiring, or in most cases it's downloading the software securely and you're not subject to all kinds of uh, possibilities of injection of malicious um, software through the way that you are acquiring uh, your dependencies. So uh, to summarize the key takeaways uh, from today, I think it's important to remember that all software is vulnerable to security threats and 5G networking software is no different here. Um, the second thing is that security network uh, software is a continuous process. It starts with the software design in the early stages. It continues through the actual software development process. The testing uh, goes on to the deployment and it should continue and evolve until the software is actually decommissioned. Unfortunately, there is no single flip switch to turn uh, for turning on security. That means that we need, need to use multiple tools and multiple best practices. Uh, all of them needs to be applied to our software to make it more secure. And finally, uh, as you've seen, the Lean Foundation offers a wide range of tools to help developers build secure software. That starts with training, goes through badging, and um, ends with dashboards that allows you to see how actually good you are in terms of uh, your secure software. So I hope you managed to learn from our experience today about developing secure software, and I hope you find practical uses for that in your software projects. Thank you.